Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Scott here, and I'm back. <laughs> Sorry I took such a long hiatus between videos, um, but uh, an overwhelming amount of you wanted to know how I shoot my light frame, so that's what we're gonna talk about today, is how to properly shoot light frames. This is all opinion. Um, I'm not an expert on the matter, but uh, this I'm just gonna share with you what works for me. So what makes up a terrestrial uh, photo is no different than what makes up an astro photo. There's still three factors that you all need to be accustomed to dealing with. Um, and those three factors are, you guessed it, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. So let's knock them out one by one. Um, the first and most important step in determining your exposure time is your mount tracking ability. So I use a little mount like this. It's an iOptron Skyguider Pro. And... Um, Longer, fewer exposures are always going to make better astro images than um, many shorter exposures. So the longer you can shoot for, the better your results are going to be. And you're going to need to get real good at polar aligning and balancing your mount so you can achieve longer exposures. Um, Dylan O'Donnell did a really in-depth video on... Um, finding out like what works best, longer, fewer exposures or many shorter exposures. And he has some really good conclusions and I'll link his video um, down below. Um, suffice it to say that not only do longer exposures make better images, but they're also going to save you time and space on your computer. So you can imagine that it's gonna be a lot quicker and um, less taxing on your computer system if you process and stack 103 minute photos rather than 630 second videos. So for me, I've gotten really good at uh, polar aligning and balancing this guy over the last uh, year or two, and I'm shooting right around two to three minutes, um, depending on you know what I'm shooting. Um, so wobbly stars, you know, is a big problem. And you can see from the image on screen now that this is when I first got the mount, I didn't really know what I was doing. And uh, this is only a 60 second photo. So this is not great. You need to get a lot better at um, balancing and polar aligning your mount in order to be able to shoot longer. Nowadays, I'm able to shoot images like this, which this is a three minute exposure. Um, and you can see that this is about as good as the mount can get, um, at least from my perspective um, with balancing and polar aligning. So that's where I generally shoot now is anywhere from two to three minutes. Um, so there we go. We just knocked out uh, shutter speed. Next is aperture, which is going to be um, lens or scope dependent. So any traditional you know, camera lens like this um, wasn't necessarily made for astrophotography. Um, and it also has its own inherent problems um, that a telescope might not have. Um, but you may also think, you know, when you're looking at a lens like a traditional photo lens, um, since you're trying to gather as many photons as possible, that you probably want to shoot as wide open as possible to gather as much data as quickly as you can. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, keeping in mind that you're still going to be shooting as long as you can, you know, shutter speed wise. Um, but lenses like that have their own inherent problems when you shoot wide open. This is an image taken from this particular lens, um, shot at about f2.8, and you can see that the center of the image is exposed more than the outside of the image. So this is something called vignetting, and there's also some distortion in there too. Now this can be corrected for, so it's not a huge issue, but it is a problem in that it's another step that you're going to need to take when you post process. Um, so you may think, okay, great, like I'll just stop down a little bit. Um, but hold on, when you do that with a traditional camera lens, you're also going to end up with its own problem that you can't fix in post, and that is diffraction spikes. So this is what happens when you take the same lens and you stop it down to f6.3. You get uh, diffraction spikes like this, which are, you know, I mean, obviously they have a problem all their own. Um, so there's a balance that comes with choosing the right aperture with the lens that you're using. Um, if you are using a telescope um, like this, like this is something that I got um, about a year and a half ago, this is an f61 fixed aperture um, 360 millimeter telescope lens, and it doesn't have the same problems that a traditional camera lens does. Obviously, it's completely manual, so I have to manually focus and all this, but 
it doesn't matter. You know, the stars aren't going anywhere. I don't need quick focus. So I don't really have to deal with distortion and diffraction spikes like I did with a traditional lens. So if you're using a, a lens like this, don't worry about um, picking your aperture. That's one more um, piece of the puzzle that you don't need to think about, which is the way I like it, uh, which is why we're doing this exercise here. Um, so shutter speed and aperture are figured out. Those are locked in, which means that there's going to be a throwaway value, a value that you're going to use to adjust um, your exposure. And that, as you may have guessed, is ISO, which is going to be camera dependent. So I use ISO to balance my exposure. Um, ISO, talking about ISO is a little tricky. Um, without going into detail about whether your camera is ISO invariant or not, and I'll link a video down below to um, Alan Wallace's uh, channel. He has a video talking about ISO invariance, and you know you can watch that and see the conclusions that he comes to with that video. But suffice it to say, generally speaking, the more data or photons that you capture, the better your results will be regardless of the ISO, within reason. Um, even older digital cameras can produce fantastic um, results in astrophotography. Um, really what ISO has more to do with is just balancing the exposure, getting your histogram to be in a certain place. Um, in my case, I generally shoot at ISO 1600. So um, where is that right place? Um, the chart on the screen here will show you a histogram. Um, and the right place for me is generally about a quarter to a third of the way from the left. So if you shoot any less than that, so if we look at this image here, um, underexposed a little bit, you might have trouble when it comes to stretching the final image after you've stacked all the images. Um, the, uh, since the overall image is underexposed, um, you may have to push the stretching of the image too far and you'll end up with more noise than you want. Um, if you shoot a little bit too hot, I guess, um, and you push the histogram too far in all your individual subframes, you may end up losing uh, data or have trouble distinguishing between some of the faint nebulosity in the images that you're trying to capture. Um, so there is a fine line there, and I like to stick, again, right at a quarter mark. That seems to work the best for me. Um, so there you have it. That is shutter speed, aperture, ISO. Um, and for me, I generally shoot it around ISO 1600, but there are also other factors that go into determining whether or not you're going to get a good image at night. Those three factors are just going to give you an overview of how exposure works when it comes to shooting the night sky stuff. But there's other factors that you need to keep in mind other than shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. So those factors are going to be things like cloud cover, which is self-explanatory, or moon phase, which is also self-explanatory. There's also light pollution. You know, like where, what Bortle scale is it where you're shooting from? Um, transparency, you know, which takes into account smoke and elevation, surface pressure, and also clouds. And then seeing, which is the level of atmospheric turbulence. It's what causes stars to twinkle. So those factors, um, now that you're being introduced to them, you may wonder, well, how do I find those? What, how do I know if what's, what's good and what's bad? Well, there's an app that you can download um, on iOS, Android, or if you're using a laptop, you can go to astrospheric.com. It's one of the best apps I've ever used to help me figure out if it's worth my time to go out for a night of shooting. Um, it's a very well thought out interface and it displays all the information, all the factors that we just talked about in a very easy to navigate, um, you know, uh, interface for you to see all of them. So let's put it all together. Um, you've You've got all your stuff, you've watched this video, you're gonna go out and you shoot, what are you, what are you gonna do next? Well, first, you're gonna need to go to Astrospheric and you're gonna need to figure out 
you know, those factors, you know, are you in a low enough Bortle area um, to get decent results? Obviously, you don't want to shoot in a Bortle 9. Um, that's not going to work for good astrophotography. You're going to need to go out a little bit further. I shoot in a Bortle 5 area, 4 or 5, um, and that seems to get really good results um, for me. Um, the second thing with these factors is transparency. Is it going to be clear? You know, are there clouds in the sky? Like, is there smoke? You know, um, these kind of things. And Astrospheric shows you whether or not it's going to be a transparent night when you go out and shoot. So this is something else that I take into account. Um, average, above average, excellent. That's where you want that chart to look where you're shooting. Um, the next is moon phase. Um, obviously, you don't want to go out and shoot when the moon is full. I generally start thinking seriously about astro imaging from first quarter to last quarter of the moon. That gives me um, about from sunset to uh, midnight shooting. There's about a two week window there between these moon phases that I can get some really good shooting um, almost all night. Um, obviously around new moon, you get more time, but from first quarter to last quarter, that's generally like the best time that I go out and shoot. Um, and then lastly is the seeing. So remember we're talking about the level of atmospheric turbulence, what keeps uh, the stars twinkling in the sky. Generally speaking, the higher and drier the environment is, the better it's gonna be for astrophotography. Um, so looking at the seeing chart when I'm looking at astrospheric will let me know if it's basically gonna be average, below average, or poor. Um, and I don't really go out and shoot when it's below average. I try, try to stick with average, above average, and excellent, just like um, I would for the transparency. So once you're done looking at astrospheric, second to that, once you're out in the field, is your mount, right? So you should know by then um, what's the maximum time that you can keep your shutter open while tracking. And for me, two to three minutes. That's my shutter speed. Um, third is going to be your aperture. So if you're using a telescope like this, you can disregard that. But if you're using a traditional camera lens like this, you should figure out by now um, what the best aperture is for your preference. Is it wide open at f2 or f2.8? Or is it maybe stopped down a little bit, f4, f5.6? Completely up to you. This is your job. Um, and then fourth is going to be ISO. Um, you're going to use the ISO to balance the exposure. Again, if you go out and you start shooting, um, you're using the two minute uh, example that we gave before. You're maybe at F61 or F56. Um, again, you're going to use the ISO to generally push or pull the histogram where you want it to be. You know, maybe you'll start at ISO 800. If that's too low, raise the ISO to 1600. If that's too low, go to 3200. Get that histogram right in the quarter mark. So from the left, quarter up. And then lastly, once all of these things have been figured out, you are going to try to get as much data as possible. So um, I generally shoot about three to four hours a night on a, on a decent night. Um, and I keep track of everything. I like to go out and check and make sure everything is still working as intended every 30 to 45 minutes. But I generally don't shoot past midnight too much because I want to go home and sleep in my own bed. So all of that being said, that is how I take light frames. That's what goes on in my head when uh, I'm trying to figure out how to take light frames the, the best way possible. Um, and in the next video, I'm going to talk about calibration frames. So darks, biases, flats. And we'll talk about how to collect those images much in the same way that I talked about getting light frames here. And make sure you uh, hit subscribe to stay tuned um, until that video comes out and clear skies. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.